Okay, some of you might remember I reviewed a book, uh, I think around Christmas time, of um, called uh, Toxic Sludge is Good for You. And this is a book by the same authors. This is Trust Us, We're Experts by Sheldon Rampton and John Stauber. Um, and the way I found this book, and I think this is a, an important little, fun little factoid too, is uh, those of you uh, who remember this, Diane Rehm uh, was, used to have a, a great morning show on NPR uh, for two hours. She had, the first hour was, I think, more of a like geopolitical discussion. And then the second hour, she'd have some kind of author on and discuss a book. And uh, I heard her interviewing these guys. And it was fantastic. And I think it was right around the time this book came out. And I liked this so much that I went back and found, I was like, what else have these guys written? And I got Toxic Sludge is Good for You. So, um, but anyway, yeah, I really miss Diane, the Diane Ream show. That was a great show. And uh, it was so sad when she left NPR. It was like uh, she had just never existed. You don't hear any talk of Diane Ream now, which is a shame because that was uh, definitely, she had some of the more insightful uh, takes on things. So, but I digress. So anyway, I wanted to discuss, uh, I'm going to cover this a little bit, but more importantly, I wanted to discuss kind of a bigger picture uh, thing about media in general that I think is some important things to, to think about in modern the modern media landscape. Anyway, Trust Us, We're Experts is all about the public relations industry and how, um, just like they say, how industry manipulates science and how and gambles with your future. And I mainly wanted to talk about this just to read this passage. This is one of the best, uh, this, is, this is a very timely chapter today, 20 years later, over 20 years later. This is the best science money can buy. And it starts with this quote from Robert Proctor of Cancer Wars. It says, science has a face a house and a price. It is important to ask who is doing science, in what institutional context, and at what cost. Understanding such things can give us insight into why scientific tools are sharp for certain problems, certain types of problems, and dull for others. And boy, that could not be more timely right now. So uh, in a time where we have hashtag follow the science um, all over the place, I think that quote sums up exactly why that could be so problematic. So um, anyway, this is a great expose of a lot, a lot of uh, case studies of a lot of different examples of um, where industry was, uh, you know, where public relations companies stepped in and kind of manipulated data to, uh, to, to get the public to go along with things they might not have otherwise gone along with. Leaded gasoline is covered in this and its effects on the population. Um, I think, if, if memory serves me right, one of the things he points out in here is that back in the days of leaded gasoline, the amount of lead put in the air at a, at a busy intersection was the equivalent of having a lead smelter operating right in that intersection. So there's a lot of interesting facts about things like that. Um, just a lot of interesting facts about industry in general. And this is one of those books that I doubt would ever get written right now. Um, that's the unfortunate thing. I, I'm afraid we've reached a point where people have retreated to their political camps. And right now, I think a lot of people who typically gravitate towards the left because they are they believe that it is their, their team is in power, so their ability to think critically about what's happening has been eroded completely. And I saw a lot of the same thing on the right back when George Bush was elected in 2000. Um, when George Bush took office, uh, the knee-jerk reaction to President Clinton was such that uh, the Republicans lost all ability to think critically. I, I was amazed at some of the idiocy that that happened the whole freedom fries episode and uh so much so it uh it it stand it's it's fitting that now we would wind up in a similar situation where as a reaction to trump 
we now have this, uh, hey, our guy's in power and they can do no wrong. And I have acquaintances and relatives that have, uh, have absolved themselves of any kind of responsibility or any kind of critical thinking about any of this situation because uh, it's not Trump, so it's gotta be good. And I think that's a, that's a really unfortunate and very um, very limited way of thinking because it basically absolves yourself of any kind of critical thought to say, uh, well, if if my political opponent said it, it must be bad. So I can't go along with that because that guy said it. So if that guy says drinking clean water is good, then I'm I'm just going to go down to Lake Levon and just take a big swig, swig of unpurified lake water because I'm going to stick it to that guy because why would he say, if he's telling me that clean water is good for me, it must be, there's something must be wrong. But that attitude is a, a way to avoid introspection and critical thought. And we all have to be on guard against that. And all we all have to check ourselves constantly against that thinking of, wait a second, am I disagreeing with that just because my political opponent said it, or is there actual good reason to say that? Because if Donald Trump says the sun comes up in the east, it still comes up in the east. If Donald Trump says war with Iran is a stupid idea, it's still a stupid idea, even though he's the one that said it. So um, I think that's an important thing to remember that uh, we all have our political sacred cows and we have to be very careful that we don't let that get in the way of our critical thinking. Um, because once it does, we turn incredibly stupid. So there's that. So anyway, um, Trust Us, We're Experts, great book from 2001. Like I said, I think it was spring of 2001 when I heard these guys interviewed on NPR and immediately ran out and uh, that was back in the days of Borders Books and Barnes and Noble first kind of taking over the book market before Amazon upset all that. And I immediately found both those books. Now, a quick word about just the media landscape. Uh, something I'd love to hear your, uh, your take on is an interesting phenomenon has occurred in the last, say, 80, let's say 80 years to be safe. So going back 80 years to say 1942, um, if you're my age, I'm in my late 40s. So if you're, in, if you're in my age bracket, your parents are the first generation to grow up, someone in their 70s to 80s is the first generation to grow up where they were exposed to mass media from the moment they were self-aware. So they, from the moment they were in their, their to a toddler, they were probably hearing, overhearing radio shows being played in their house. And then in their later, in their uh, young adult years, that they were introduced to television, comic books and all that. So you had, for the first time in human history, you had people growing up with pop culture where you had this competing, uh, competing force for the interest of the child where no longer was the parent the one really raising the child. You had this competing force, which was mass media, um, really telling the child what is cool, what's uh, a good job to have, what the right amount of money to make, what are the cool things to have. All of those forces whispering in the child's ear saying, this is what's really cool. I know mom and dad are saying X, Y, and Z, but this is what's really cool, okay? So really, our grandparents, people my age, our grandparents are the first generation to really have to contend with that moment of rebellion every teenager goes through where they're exploring their, their, their independence. And that was the first generation in the 40s, really, was the first generation, the people born then, was the first generation that had an outside influence that really took that and took some of the uh, power away from the parents and said, no, no, we are the real authority. We're who you really should work, look to. So before, uh, little Billy might look to dad and say, dad's a leather worker or you know, dad uh, works at the local factory or whatever. And uh, I've heard dad talk about that. That seems like a cool thing to do. Or dad's a carpenter or whatever. And maybe I want to be a carpenter. Um, now, all of the influences, all of the examples, all of the role models were now coming from mass media rather than the local community. 
So my parents are really that first generation to have that influence where mass media became the real, the, the real culture and kind of an artificial um, surrogate culture because it, it was really replacing what the real actual nuts and bolts culture was that people could actually uh, check in their own existence. And then my generation really took that to the extreme. We're the first generation to have television from the cradle where most people were raised in a house with at least one television, um, magazines, everything else, all competing for your interest. But again, those in those formative teenage years, you have uh, the rebellion really being underscored by uh, things like MTV and all these things telling you, you could be a rock star or who you should really be looking up to is these media personalities and uh, you know your parents are a bunch of squares, they're just going to work every day. Who wants to do that when you could do these really cool things that we're gonna show you on television? So now, people my age have children and uh, they're contending with a whole new level of social media. So I say all this to say, we are now in, in the, really the third generation now. Some of you watching this are gonna be in the third generation that is totally immersed in pop culture to a point where objective reality is really takes a back seat to what is presented in the media. So what normally what used to be your community is now again that's that's really a footnote to your actual life that you're living is through pop culture through uh, social media and things like that and when you think about the effect that has on the the culture at large is really terrifying because that means we live in a world where reality is now dictated by mass media not by objective reality if i experience something even directly experience something in my daily life i'm going to have a tendency if i'm really immersed in that pop culture world i'm going to have a tendency to say my reaction is going to be well i'm the exception it's only that way in my life, but everybody else I'm seeing on television thinks this other way. So it's real easy to get in a, a situation where you stop believing your own experience because you think your own experience is an exception. So even though you might meet someone from say Ukraine or Russia that might tell you something different, you say, well, that's the exception because I know what's really happening and I heard it from CNN or you know whatever the streaming service or whatever you're, wherever you're getting your news. So I say this as kind of a call to arms mentally for those of you watching this to really think about retreating from popular culture and retreating from mass media and looking for as many other sources and as much community sources as you can for what's happening in your world and not looking to mass media. So anyway, and. It's kind of a, a long way to explain trust us we're experts but um, good book again if you're into this sort of thing this is a good uh, a good work to uh, look at to understand especially the public relations industry because that's one of those industries that's really driving mass media that a lot of people don't realize how critical uh, public relations companies are to their perception a lot of opinions that you hold that you think are your opinion are actually conjured up in a boardroom at a public relations office. So anyway, I'll leave it at that. Stop now. But it's Trust Us, We're Experts by Sheldon Rampton, John Stauber from 2001. And again, how mystery, I'm sorry, how industry manipulates science and gambles with your future.